Hold on, Dusty. Before we jump into this week's episode, uh, Matthew has some very exciting news to share with everybody. So Matthew, why don't you tell us what's going on? So we are launching a new podcast on Eloquent Gushing. We are launching Across the Arrowverse. This is myself and my partner Catherine. Every week we're going to uh, have a discussion about the latest episodes in the Arrowverse. So Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl and DC's Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, We're aiming for it to be about half an hour every episode, talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, what we're expecting to come up, and the ongoing stories and and themes in the shows, Um, with a a little bit of a wider view than I think other shows do. So we're going to look at what they're doing as a crossover, the differences between the shows, and, and what they're bringing in from the wider DC universe. I'm really excited about this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the DC shows, and it will actually prompt me to watch the shows instead of, you know, getting six or seven weeks <laughs> behind like I did last year. And there is an intro episode available on iTunes, so you guys can go ahead and subscribe. Yeah, just search for Across the Arrowverse, um, and we have details to subscribe for iTunes and Google Play available on our website, eloquentgushing.com. and welcome to the show. This is episode number 41 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about the River Song arc of Doctor Who on your River Song Didn't Get It All From You, sweetie, podcast. I'm Andy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. Hey, Mandy, why is the Doctor so good at flavors when he's cooking? I don't know, Matthew. Why? Because he's a Time Lord. So now we got that out of the way. (laughs) Okay. Was I supposed to laugh? Yes, that's a good joke. That's solid. <laughs> time. Time. Oh. Time. God. <laughs> that went completely over my head. Wow. Okay. Do, that's do, staying in. <laughs> do you want to do that again? <laughs> no, I think that my, my stupidity needs to stay in. <laughs> we are on our final episode talking about Doctor Who, and we've really kind of already gone through all 10 seasons, but we skipped the River Song arc so that we could do it all at once. And if you're not familiar with who River Song is and why she's important, she is a character who was introduced in series four of Doctor Who. She was created by Stephen Moffat, but it was during Russell T. Davies' run. And once Moffat took over in series five, he greatly expanded the character. River is also a time traveler, so her meetings with the Doctor are non-linear. The Doctor's future is River's past, and the first time the Doctor meets her is the day she dies. She is a companion, romantic, flirt, and eventual wife of the Doctor. Now, Matthew, since I've already said all of that, why don't you tell us what the River Song arc is about? Uh, The River Song arc is the Doctor meeting a woman who is important to him in his future, and he is important to her in her past. Yes. Yes. All of the above. (laughs) So, Matthew, now that you've already seen bits and pieces of all of the Doctors, and you had seen just a little bit of River Song, what were your expectations coming into this one? This was the bit of Doctor Who that I was most interested in watching. Um, An age ago, there was some reference to it. For, For whatever reason, I heard about the River Song arc. I don't know whether I read about it on a website or maybe when one of the Christmas specials was on people were talking about it so I knew some of the details already and and it sounded like actually quite an interesting take on non-linear storytelling having two characters who are out of sync with each other I think I expected probably more episodes than we actually got and and actually I expected more characters playing River than we got I I thought there was going to be a bit more of throughout her life so we'd see her growing up more oh okay that's interesting so like a younger person playing Alex Kingston, effectively, right. rather than her at one point coming fully formed as Alex Kingston forever. Okay. No, that makes sense. Uh, did you expect her to have like, the capability to regenerate? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I think that was the thing that threw me, because, again, from reading about it ages and ages ago, I think I knew she was Rory and Amy's daughter, 
But I think that's why I expected us to see her, like, having some story with him in teenage years, in her 20 years, and then eventually it being Alex Hingston aged down and then maybe aged up or something through makeup and prosthetics. Okay. That would be interesting to see. Hmm. So, so I think when we saw the regeneration bits, I didn't expect that. So it sort of made me go, oh, I'm not sure if this is River or if this is something else that's going on. Okay. But it always was. <laughs> Everything we saw in this. The answer if to any mystery, oh, it's River. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, did you enjoy this arc? Yes. With a couple of reservations. I think if we were doing this show two years ago before Christmas 2015, I would be raving about the arc. I'd be raving about the character. Um, I'd be very excited about what was coming next. For me, Husbands of River Song took away from the arc. Oh, um, that hurts so much. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> which, which, and we're going to obviously discuss that in detail uh, a little bit later on. Because that's obviously very significant to it but is is one separate point to the whole thing you'll notice i'm very clearly saying arc the character of river song i think is excellent i think she's done very well she's portrayed very well she's written very well there's there's lots of good in there to enjoy e- even throughout and and the husband's of river song is very good when you look at the character but when you look at the arc i think that final episode betrays it somewhat but everything else i really enjoyed and, and it's been quite interesting since watching them to go back and have a look at the list and really consider it because there's only a handful of episodes in in the what maybe 15 that we watched that are actually part of her arc there's probably only five or six episodes that are this is the story of river song but she comes up in other episodes to help uh, build that relationship and build some of the the dynamic between her and the doctor and the ponds would you have left those out Ooh, no because i don't th- think there are any bad episodes in this set that we've watched any episodes that have river song in it for more than a couple of minutes are not a bad episode in this list (laughs) oh wait okay so so that caveat then means closing time i'd have left closing time out yeah (laughs) i still maintain that closing time is worth it just for stormageddon dark lord of all yes i will die on that hill i just will one joke doth not a good episode make. I'm sorry, but you're you're not wrong. Honestly, you're not wrong. I get it, um, but I did think the the coda at the end with River Song was important to her arc specifically. Mm. Okay. So. Um. Yeah, I think there's the time of angels and flesh and stone, and possibly Pandora opens, and then the angels take Manhattan. Those very much are not River Song episodes, but she's in there too help explain some of it away to deal with some of the plot points about time travel uh, i think i think they're useful to it but they're not vital to her arc okay i guess it depends then on what you think her arc is is when you're referring to the river song arc are you specifically referring to how river song became river song and how she was the child of the ponds who was stolen and basically brainwashed to kill the doctor. That's her arc. Because for me, the river song arc is basically river's life. And so that encompasses all of the adventures that she has with the doctor, even the ones that are off screen. And so I think maybe we be, we may be talking about two different things when we say river songs arc. Yeah. I think when I say arc, I'm, I'm referring explicitly to the, the mystery of river. Okay. So when she's first introduced to David Tennant, there are all these questions about what do they mean to each other? Are they married? What do the handcuffs mean? Why did she keep saying spoilers? <laughs> yeah, there, there are lots of questions in there. How did she get to learn his name? Right. And then it becomes a further mystery with the, the, you know, the detail of her parentage and her regeneration and the fact that she's the one inside the astronaut suit and so on, which are filled in throughout several episodes. The episodes that I talked about that we could take out, particularly those Angel episodes, they don't really do much to the relationship of the Doctor and River. Okay. So she's she's a part of the episodes. I don't think she does... Uh, it does anything for the character of her. I think I have to disagree, just because while those moments aren't important to 
the specific arc that you're talking about. I think they are important in helping us understand the relationship between River and the Doctor. If we didn't have Flesh and Stone and how flirty she was with Matt Smith, we wouldn't really be set up to understand what's happening later. I think having that also gave us that exposition of how he understands that his future is her past. And he didn't really understand that in Silence of the Library and Forest of the Dead. It wasn't until he met her again that he really started to understand what was going on. And so each one of their interactions, even if it had nothing to do with the greater arc of the mystery of River, it had to do with their relationship building and you know, getting to see River always try to sync her diary with him to see, as we see, her diary is progressively getting fuller. So she's obviously been off doing things with the doctor and trying to figure out what he knows. I think those are important character moments that would have been greatly missed if we hadn't seen them. At the end of uh, Forest of the Dead, he has her diary and he says, this is my future in here. I could read everything I'm going to be doing with her. Uh, you are right. He he that does then just leave it lying around. So <laughs> he puts it in the biography section. <laughs> okay. Of the library. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I completely agree with you that it's good to get those character beats from her to learn more about their relationship and see it evolving. I don't feel like we ever got anything over and above what we were told that they care very much for each other. We see a bit of him coming to care for her but mostly I think it's the intrigue I don't think we ever got the episode where we saw them falling for each other definitely from her perspective let's kill Hitler she kills him with the lipstick which is very nice because mm-hmm. um, again it's good continuity but it's just such a small moment but it's, well, it's done really well and then she sees him trying to save the Pons and she decides he's a good man and that she's going to love him, so she saves him with regeneration magic. I feel like I'm just being told that they love each other, and I'm never shown it. Like, almost, there there should be an episode in there where there is some adventure, some crisis, some search for a thing, and they're on opposite sides of it, but they have to work together to get out, and in doing so, learn that the other is actually really good, or someone they could care for. Just... You know, some actual story that their relationship is tangential to the story, but it's an important thing to show, ah, this is the one where that relationship is formed. Okay. Now, that makes perfect sense. I think what the show did, and I'm not sure I like this because even I haven't seen these things, they did show a lot of that extra textually. There are web shorts that Mm. show dates between the Doctor and River. You know, you heard Jim, uh, them mention Jim the Fish several times. Well, that was actually a date that they did record, and it was shown online. I haven't actually seen it because I'm a terrible person and a horrible Doctor Who fan, apparently. <laughs> but that happened with several other encounters that they had. So their their relationship was shown canonically off screen, <laughs> but still kind of on screen, just not in the show. And so for me, I can just accept that and be like, okay, that's what it is. But I completely understand if you're not aware of those and you're only going by what you've seen, they didn't really do a great job of showing us that evolution. Now, I have seen those shorts. Okay. And and you're absolutely right. They are dates. They are them. There's, there's a very good one where she goes into the wrong TARDIS. And so you've effectively got three rivers inside the same TARDIS interacting with Matt Smith. And it ends off with him taking her to the singing towers of whatever. Um, You know, the thing at the end of the Husbands of River song? The singing towers of Dorelium. That's the one. It ends with him taking her off to there, um, which is, I think, then referencing the Husbands. She's like, oh, we were in there once, but you you cancelled. Right. But again, it's just, it, it feels very much, it's like, oh, okay, and they're in love. And they go off and have fun together. But I've never... I I just don't feel like I've ever had that moment of I can see them falling for each other here. I can see her learning that he's actually a good man, knowing she's going to kill him in the future or 
has killed him and they did something else to bring him back. And him realising that there's actually a heart of gold in there. As I'm saying this, I'm thinking, to me, it, ke- it keeps coming from River's side that I've never seen her falling in love with him. Be- and I think that's actually because he falls in love with her in Silence in the Library. Oh. That's the episode, yeah, where he sees her being capable, caring for people, doing stuff in a very Doctor, Time Lord kind of way. Um, and then he sees her sacrifice herself for him, someone that he doesn't know or she doesn't know she's sacrificing herself for. Right. So I can see, yeah, I wonder if that's the episode why I'm I'm not so worried about seeing it from the Doctor's perspective. I really like that. I had never really considered it because for me, their relationship just is. Mm. I mean, it, through the ages, it just is. The Doctor and River are a thing for me, which is so yeah. funny. that This is a tangent really quick, but... For me, when I think of the doctor and his girlfriend, I always think of Rose. I think of David Tennant and Rose. But when I think of, like, the actual love of the doctor's life, I always come back to River and this arc and the two of them together. It's very strange. Very strange. Yeah, and particularly with Peter Capaldi, they did that very well with the Doctor Mysterio episode where he's mourning her. And then he's got a picture of her on his desk in the pilot. Those are very nice yes. moments. So, So that helps us understand it from his perspective um as a separate question before i dive into some of the really heavy stuff when the name of the doctor aired and and the name of the doctor is doing a lot of work so so his final interaction with river and the final goodbye sweetie moment it, it, it's almost lost in in a lot of other stuff going on but did you feel that was the last time you were going to see river yes Absolutely. When I found out she was coming back for the Christmas special with Peter Capaldi, I was ecstatic. Okay. I had no idea how they were going to do it, what part of the timeline it was going to be in, just because it didn't make sense. But I really thought she was done at that point. And it's silly because, I mean, this this is a show about time travel, but I, I mean, her story was done. And was that a good ending for you? No. Okay. Honestly. It, I mean, it made me cry because it's very sad. And I loved the interactions that they had together in that mm. episode. But, I mean, it's – she's not actually dead, you know? He called her an echo and told her she had to let go. But she's not actually dead. Her body is dead, but her consciousness is still in that computer, and she's going to be there forever and ever and ever. So I didn't really see why they had to make her fade away like that. But that's just me. Okay. As I say, if we were recording after that, but before the husband's of, yeah, I, I would have liked that because you're right. It leaves a bit of potential for her, uh, kind of the, her future, but also it hasn't wrapped up any future stories she might have with the Doctor. It leaves things open. Okay? Yeah. The Husbands of River Song, however, closes the oh. book on River. <laughs> if they have any future episodes with her, they are going to have to do some... Uh, bending backwards, whistling to, <laughs> to get round everything. Because it, yeah. it it ends with her last night. Um, well, right. it, it opens with him saying, I've got a new haircut and this is my best suit. So even from the very opening of the episode, like they're leaning on this is going to be that night we heard about, what, like 10 years ago? Something like that. Um right. And then it ends with that night, and she knows it's her last night because she seems to have been Googling herself. (laughs) Which is never a good idea. It's not good for the soul. Um, So there's a bit of a retcon because she, in silence, and uh, well, in uh, her last moment in Forest of the Dead, she didn't know she was going to be... That that was the last time. She only realises that as as she's about to sacrifice herself. Right. Uh, fine. It it fits the narrative emotion of the moment. So, you know, I can I can let them go for that. But the fact that she didn't know he had new regenerations, that bit in the middle where she's got all of his photos, but she doesn't know he has a new set, means she can't have interacted with him in the future. Or she can't yes. have interacted with him in the future knowing that that person is the Doctor. Correct. So if she meets Jodie Whittaker, Jodie Whittaker's going to have to do a whole thing of... No, she can't know who I am because it would create a paradox and change things. And I, I don't no. understand why they've done that, why they've closed the books so permanently. Because they really wanted Alex Kingston and Peter Capaldi to be in an episode together. Can I, I... I've been thinking on this a lot, as you can tell. 
Like, th- this yes. episode really bothered me. Um, can I propose a headcanon, or not a headcanon, uh, a fan fiction variant on that end sequence? Please do. He takes her to the restaurant, the Singing Towers of... Deroleum. <laughs> and he gives her a present. And it's the sonic screwdriver because he didn't like having the sonic trail, but we all know what's inside the sonic screwdriver. In my version, he gives her a present, and it's a new diary, because she was all sad about her diary being filled up, and he says, I didn't expect you to write with such large handwriting. She then has <laughs> she has her whole speech about, this is the restaurant we go to on the last night, and he says, well, who knows, if we like the food, maybe we'll come back. And fade out. It it could still be that last night. It still sort of fits that same thing. But it leaves us open to like, yay, the more adventures. Okay. They did sort of leave it open a little bit, though, because one night on Dorelium is 24 years. And a lot of shenanigans can happen in 24 years. Yeah, but Peter Capaldi's dead now. So they cannot fit in any more adventures with Peter Capaldi. On, right, on the TV but- show. Maybe during those 24 years, she goes in the future. <laughs> I, I mean, I know it's a yeah, stretch. Yeah. I know it's a stretch. And that's that's but... exactly what I'm saying when, it, when I'm talking about, like, bending over backwards, whistling to try and just, like... Yeah. I, I don't... Oh. As I say, it frustrated me. And that's that's... It's a shame. I like that it frustrates you, though, because it closes the door on her coming back, because that means you really did like her. Yeah. Oh, as a character, and as I say, up until the point where they went, no, no more with this character, fine. Because I, I was always waiting for the episode where they had an adventure, where it was just them having an adventure. There weren't secrets, there wasn't an arc, there wasn't a plot to uncover, there wasn't, you know, the, the silence or something interfering with it. She wasn't dead. <laughs> just, and it turns out they do have that, but it's the last adventure, and for half of it, she doesn't know he's the Doctor, and she acts... Like, quite differently when she doesn't know. And then as soon as she knows, there's a switch. And she becomes flirty and almost more capable than they've, sh- they've shown her for the rest of the episode. I quite like that about her, honestly. Uh, that actually does bring me to a question I had for you about this episode. Hmm. When you were watching it, did you think that the Doctor believed River when she was going on and on about how the the man who gave her the diary wasn't anybody special, that she just used him and he was just there for whatever, however she said it. D- do you think he believed her and was, like, sad or disappointed or, or whatever? No. We're, we're supposed to think that they know each other uh, inside and out so well. No, he knows that she both has this element of duplicity as well as... Uh, carrying his secrets, as it were. Right. She's the one who knows his name. She's the one who understands him better than anyone else. But she wouldn't tell other people that. Right. Okay. That's that's a really good answer. I like it. Thanks. Did you believe it? Did you think he believed it? Uh, the first time I saw it, I, I did for a minute. Mm-hmm. Just because Peter Capaldi is really good at doing that face. <laughs> 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 I have um, cross arms. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but you know, watching watching it on rewatch and kind of understanding the nuance of Peter Capaldi's acting better since I've seen so much more of him now, I see it more as thoughtful consideration rather than disappointment. Okay. And of course, we know where it leads to. So, can I tell you why I love this episode so much? Go on. I adore this episode because it gives us a part of the Doctor that we've never really seen before. And what's what's the best way for me to explain this? One, it's ridiculously cheesy in so many ways, like laughably eye-rolling cheesy. But they counter that with these really deep emotional moments that are just amazing. And I don't want to steal one of your favorite moments, so I'm going to try not to do that. Don't you dare, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the moment when River figures out who he is, that one moment is enough to make this an excellent episode for me. If everything else in this episode was horrible, that one moment would be enough to redeem it. 
because I loved it so much. But again, you know, I come to this for sentimentality. Mm. And I got sentimentality <laughs> in this episode, like by the handful. Without being super specific, because I know we'll talk about some of these things later, there's a lot of humor in this mm. episode, too. Humor in a way that we don't often see. You know, with Matt Smith, most of the humor we got was kooky, just kind of wiry humor. Mm-hmm. The the things like you had talked about uh, in our last show, like the, the cup of soup comment. You know, he does things like that all the time. He says these random crazy things, and then he takes them back, and it's funny. Mm-hmm. But it's not belly gut laughter funny and you got some of that in this episode and so mixing that kind of humor with sentimentality plus the sheer chemistry that alex kingston and peter capaldi have with each other was just enough to make this one of my favorite episodes of dr who yeah i'm trying to picture it without that end sequence or or with my end sequence and yeah i would if if this had ended without so firmly closing the door and leaving me feeling a little unsatisfied with the whole thing. Yes, I would be talking about this as a triumph. Okay. Hmm. I kind of like that it closes the loop, though, because it ties back so nicely to silence in the library in Forest of the Dead. But it doesn't. It doesn't. She, in, in Forest of the Dead, she does not know until that moment that that was the last night where she says... You came on, on, you turned up on my doorstep with a new haircut and, a, and your finest suit, which is exactly the lines he uses. Right. And then we had this night of dancing and it went on for years and it was so, so amazing. And if you give me a second, I'll look up the script. But there is something like, you must have known it was the last night. And I guess I knew, but without knowing. Okay, so you think they just were a little too explicit. Yeah, because she says... Yeah, there, there are people who write about our last night and and say this is where it is and so on. Like like I say, she's been Googling herself and has found out how she dies. Right. Well, not how she dies, when she dies. The funny thing is, this means you've always known how I was going to die. All the time we've been together, you knew I was coming here. But I saw you, the real you, the future you. I mean, you turned up on my doorstep with a new haircut and a suit. He took me to Derillium to see the singing towers. Oh, what a night that was. The towers sang. And you cried. Auto destruction. You wouldn't tell me why. One but I suppose you knew it was time. My time. Time to come to the library. You even gave me your screwdriver. That should have been a clue. There's no- I, th- I think they complement each other. I think... <laughs> I think Moffat was a little too heavy-handed with her emotion Mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. But none of what you just said is actually inaccurate because he doesn't actually explicitly confirm to her. She asks, and he says spoilers. He doesn't say it, and so she doesn't know, but she knows. And so I think it works. At least it works well enough for me. But I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, I, I just... It's it's a little too much. Uh, but that is one of the things with Doctor Who. It is not so concerned with its own continuity. It's much more concerned with delivering something good in the moment. And if we have to do some hand-waving around something else that's happened, we'll deal with it. Our fans aren't that obsessive about the detail, surely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> Okay, well, now that we have talked about the end of River Song's arc, let's go back and talk about some of the stuff at the beginning. I think my favorite thing that you have written in this outline is under talking points, your very first talking point is everything. (laughs) I think that may be my favorite thing that you've ever done in one of our shows and for it to be a Doctor Who episode that just delights me to no end but I'm curious what you actually mean by everything we saw yeah that's not entirely true I did write everything we saw and then gave a list of things um (laughs) it still says everything (laughs) yes I want to talk about everything what you know how I mentioned for name of the doctor and I said it's doing a lot of heavy lifting a lot of work on different plots at that point Right. It, it, it's an ongoing thing, and I, I suspect this might be a Stephen Moffat thing, that every episode has a lot of plot going on, 
And sometimes there are things that themselves in another show would be their own episode, but in here they are just one thing. So learning that the uh, learning that River is a prisoner and that she has killed someone is is done throughout those first episodes with her. Flesh and Stone and Time of the Angels. Yes. So that's where where we find that out. And then there's this whole other plot and we do stuff about the origin of the angels and their abilities and, and they get fleshed out. The Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon have all the stuff about the silence and they have things about the Doctor when he's eventually going to die. We have the Doctor now. We have dealing with bits of... Um, is that the one where we start dealing with the pregnancy as well? Yes, because it's after the Big Bang, um, which is where she gets pregnant. Stephen Moffat's not very subtle on that one, is he? <laughs> oh, no. No. Yeah, it just... Every episode... This is all, almost the thing with me um, saying about how episodes to do with River's arc. If we are saying the arc is all of the River episodes, they're, they're not just River episodes because it's doing a lot within there. You know, and the, the Angels Take Manhattan is a whole thing explaining him going to New York randomly and explaining stuff to do with the River... And then the finale of The Ponds as well. Right. I feel like Stephen Moffat is the kind of writer where he writes down every idea he's ever had on pieces of paper, and then he throws them all in a blender and puts them all together to be one thing. (laughs) Possibly. I don't think he's ever had an idea that he didn't fit into one of his scripts. Yeah. And sometimes that's really great, and sometimes it's overwhelming. Mm. And I think that's, that's why I am very much in the camp where I feel like Stephen Moffat his run is done it needed to be done at least a season or two ago and i'm really excited that we're getting a new showrunner hmm. next season when when jody whitaker comes on because i'm really looking forward to seeing what someone who's not Stephen moffat will do with the doctor and maybe we'll get less chaos which i'm not actually sure is possible with the doctor but you know we can try yeah because modern uh prestige tv like this is either very heavily serialized so you need to have seen the whole season to really understand the pieces of it. Uh, 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 Mad Men, Westworld, Game of Thrones, something like that. Or it needs to pare down the ideas so each episode has a lot of room to breathe to allow exploration of these ideas to a good level. And then take anything you learn from that into the next episode. Right. Stephen Moffat tries to do a little bit of both, mm. I think. And the name of the Doctor is... Uh, probably the worst the the most guilty of this because i mean it's wrapping up a couple of stories it's doing the transalor thing it's doing the death and the grave of the doctor it's doing the is it the great intelligence yes whatever that thing is it's, so, so we've had a bit of that that is now being brought in as well it's wrapping up the clara impossible girl thing it's dealing with what's happened to uh river since forest of the dead Oh, and then we're also going to set up the War Doctor that we've never mentioned before, but now we're going to introduce him. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. It's falling over itself to try and get some ideas in there. I, I feel like perhaps we could have spread them out a little more. I, I don't disagree with you at all on that. So when I say everything we saw, like this is this is part of the thing of it. It just it fits so much into only a few episodes. All, all those episodes that we've watched uh, for the previous podcast shows. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I was left with a number of questions on them and things that I didn't fully see. And yet in these few episodes, I've seen so much and so much wrapped up and given me detail. So so you felt like these were a little bit more complete stories just with too much packed into too few episodes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the good things with watching lots of um, episodes in, in one arc is you get to see a lot of the recurring things that come up. And, and th- this is over the last three months of this project as well. There's a number of things written in here that I quite like that they're brought forward. I feel like when they're used to an appropriate level, they're done really well. So the most obvious is the Doctor Who joke, which I feel is dramatic. <laughs> you hate? Well, yeah, I feel it's dramatically reduced in, in the Stephen Moffat years to the extent that sometimes there are good uses of the Doctor Who joke. I, I t- spoke last month about Missy using it really well. Um, it was done once or twice here, particularly in Let's Kill Hitler. I think he even says Doctor Who as a as a joke, and it, it lands really well. It's just it felt like we'd had it too often almost. Okay. But things like where he talks, uh, and, and I'm not sure if this is supposed to be recurring or if it's just a beat that they like so they use it more than they should, where he, he makes a comment of, like, if if you wanted to get out of this situation, there's absolutely one thing 
you shouldn't have put in this situation. Me. Right. Uh, Matt Smith and Pete Capaldi use that once or twice. And it's it's a nice moment. And it's good that that's, it comes across as a character thing that he does, character beat. But I'm not sure the writers know <laughs> that it's a character beat. I think they might just come up with it every few years and go, that's really nice, John. Put it in the script. <laughs> no, I I think it's consistent with who the Doctor's been since the beginning. Maybe less so with Eccleston, but definitely I see that with Tennant. He may not have specifically said me, but he definitely used that idea a lot. Mm. In in some of the ways that, that even you said you, you dislike him, where he thinks he's the smartest person in the room and he's the one who has all of the answers, that's very much in line with, you know, what don't you do if you want to win? You don't put me in this situation. Yeah. And perhaps it's... So I, I feel like it's consistent. Mm. It's just maybe less explicit than what we get later. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and the one that doesn't come up very often, or does it come up very often? I don't know. I tried to find a list and I couldn't. But the line, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. Lots of people use that in lots of different situations. Like sometimes it is just a throwaway episode, you know, Monster of the Week type thing. But someone says that. And that's quite nice. Because it brings all the emotion of, of when we've seen it on those pivotal moments to know someone is being genuinely sorry. Right. Hmm. I'm trying to think of, of when it was used. I know Tennant used it a couple of times. And I recall Matt Smith using it once because I remember thinking, oh, that's something that Tennant said. And I really like that. And so that that's nice continuity. But I think a lot of the times he just said, I'm sorry, not I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. But they kind of convey the same thing just maybe slightly less yeah i definitely know david tennant used it several times because i think he does it to the cyberman Mm -hmm. and he does it in the canary wharf episode but i I just know that in watching these and i really wish i'd i really wish i'd noted down when i saw it but there were just every so often someone would say it to someone else i'm like that's quite nice they're continuing to use it something to watch out for in future i'm sure So before we jump into some of the questions that we got from our listeners that are more specifically about River, I want to bring up a few of the things that we saw in this arc that I think are quite lovely that aren't really part of River's arc. Okay. And I I wanted to see, did you notice the continuity of them bringing up how often the Doctor should not travel alone? Did, Did you pick up on that? Did you notice that? I don't think so. Okay. Because we didn't see, we saw the end of the ponds, but we didn't see the start and end of anyone else. No, well. Oh, we saw the husbands think, with him having the antlers put on his head. Well, yes. But it, it came up more so in this arc because I think one of the things that you didn't really get to see, but you kind of did, was that the ponds were not continually with the doctor. And so. And in the episodes that you saw, it wasn't completely clear. You know, if you weren't paying super attention, you probably could have missed it. But, like, he had been gone for two years by the time he showed back up to see them in The Impossible Astronaut. Okay. And so he was constantly kind of alone and stuff. And then in the episode when he asks River to travel with him and River says, I'll I'll go with you anywhere, anytime, just not all of the time because two psychopaths can't be in the TARDIS. She specifically tells him, but you need to not travel alone. Um, In closing time, James Corden's character is like, you need to not be alone. (laughs) And it came up a couple of other times and I just thought it was interesting because we had just come off of our last conversation about Doctor Who and bringing it back around to how David Tennant's doctor really screwed up when he was alone and figured out he didn't need to travel alone. And so I thought it was really nice that they continued that and continued to bring it up once he regenerated into Matt Smith. And I saw it a lot in these episodes. Yeah, I don't think I picked up on it in that same way. Or if I did, I thought of it as exactly as you're saying. Oh, yes, that's that point they've done in the past. Okay. Yeah. It was interesting, the point about River not travelling with him all the time. And I I wonder what that's about. Because, like, I don't know why you do that. It would be more fun to have River travelling with him for several episodes, I think. And a good ratings grab, perhaps. (laughs) So is that Alex Kingston didn't want to commit to several episodes? Is it they were worried about the um, 
classification board because it gets a little bit raunchier when River's around, so you can get away with it for one episode, <laughs> but you can't turn Doctor <laughs> Who into that thing. I don't know. I would say they probably chose not to do that because she was his wife, and this is not the story of the Doctor and his wife, and it would fundamentally change the tone of the story if they did that. Mm. Because like you say, we do know that they have more adventures together. I think there's even a line of him living with otters for a month because they had a fight. Right. I think she, I think their story works better when they're not together all the time. Okay. But that's just, I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. I I, I feel like the reason for that, they, they write a good reason for it. I just don't think you'd have made that choice if you didn't have to. I think Stephen Moffat would have. Maybe. Since the whole mm. point of this arc was that they were essentially star-crossed lovers. Yeah, true. You know, and, and Moffat likes to go for the kill sometimes. You know, and <laughs> I don't mean that literally, but I mean he, he kind of likes to dig in that knife a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you did also get to see why Clara was the impossible girl. I know I specifically told you in our last chapter's <laughs> episode that you would not see that. And then, oh, guess what? You did because I completely forgot that's what this episode was about. Because <laughs> that episode um, also had that plot going on in it. <laughs> it did. <laughs> and Richard E. Grant and, and John Hurt. And <laughs> yes, this episode had a lot in it. And I was just thinking about the river parts. Uh, so I wanted to see, did that give you... Any insight into Clara's character at all? Was it just confusing because it was this random thing you were seeing when you hadn't seen the rest of it? Although they did do a fairly good job of setting it up because they gave her that voiceover at the beginning. Mm. I think I'd seen enough of it anyway from The Rings of Akatan, where he says that she's in the impossible girl. Right. Um, so I knew there was a, a thing there. And then, like you say, they, they added a, a previously on type thing to, to help us understand it in her voiceover. So I did understand it. It felt really easily wrapped up. And especially because they tried to put some peril into it. We're like, no, we know she gets this done. Because we've right. seen it. So uh, I can almost get them doing it really quickly like that because we've already seen it. So why spend so much time on it? But also it was just like, oh, yeah, she jumps in the thing. <sighs> I I, I don't know. If I'd thought about it, I would have expected a bigger reason or for it to have been less obvious that she was going to jump in and appear at lots of times throughout his life. Honestly, that's part of why I don't like Clara's arc. Mm. Um, I think she doesn't have a lot of chemistry with Matt Smith. And I think they didn't do a very good job of writing her story because her story is essentially Matt Smith's doctor has run into a woman with this face and this name several times throughout history, and she doesn't remember any of it, and that's why she's impossible. And then they have all these adventures together, and he's still trying to figure it out, and she's starting to get freaked out, and then we get this episode, and it's all wrapped up. Yeah. And if they had had a lot of chemistry on screen, it probably would have been different, but it just was not enjoyable for me to watch them together. So when you put all of that together, it was... Just not great. But this episode is fantastic because of River. And I wanted to see what you thought of the dynamic between Matt Smith and River here because this is obviously after River's died and he is very clearly affected by her absence and seeing her again. And I wanted to see if you thought that emotion was earned. I'm going to guess that you're going to say no uh, based on some other things that you said in this conversation. But were you surprised by it? Did it did it affect you at all? Or was it just a smaller piece of this gigantic episode that had too many things going on? My initial reaction was, wait, how can he see her? <laughs> this is, you know, stepping into the realm of fantasy magic stuff. Right. And I wasn't totally sure what to think. And, and then it was, it was actually my fiancé who because we watched it together, she pointed out kind of why it's a bit weird and a bit problematic. The Doctor's not gone to see River. He knows he can go and visit her. He knows he... Now he is at the end of her story, effectively. He could go and speak to her in the library, but he has never visited her. And it's almost this is part of the problem with their relationship in total. He never really gives anything for her. I think we've had comments from other people along these lines that very much she exists to be part of his story. Not not quite in a she's fridged, 
type of way to motivate him, but her role in the story is to move along bits of his plot to fill in things to give drama to moments where oh she's going to kill him or now she's going to save him or or get married to him and it was just very sad that after knowing that she died and knowing filling in all those details as he goes through his life he never goes and actually visits her and the whole I don't like endings thing is just well then he's a great big giant man child and it gives me less sympathy for him. Well, he is a great big giant man child at times. I mean, he has to have flaws, right? And that's one of them. Yeah. And I, I feel like they had done a really good job of setting that up in the Angels Take Manhattan when River breaks her wrists to get out of the Weeping Angel. And she is telling Amy. Okay. Why did you lie? Never let him see the damage. And never, ever let him see you age. He doesn't like endings. And I think that doesn't paint the doctor in a very flattering no. light, mm. but that doesn't make it untrue. And I think setting that up is is something they needed to do because the doc I mean the doctor is eternal essentially and i don't think you got to see this in any of the episodes that we watched in this run but the doctors had family he had a wife he had children he had grandchildren Mm. he's outlived them all Mm. and he's outlived all of the people that he cares for and he knows that's going to happen and and so that's why he doesn't like endings because he knows That especially since he has such an affinity for humans now, that he's always going to see them age and die. And so I can give him a little bit of a pass on that, even though I think it's kind of shitty. I I think I have two reactions to that. One is you're absolutely right that he is not painted in a good light because of that. It just, if we're saying that River is trying to protect him, it makes me feel a bit less for her as well. She always comes across as this... Uh, very vivacious, very capable, very intelligent character. But she's trying to protect the man from being a bit sad and, and going off her. Then he's not worthy of her. And, and, and on the other point, he's like 1,200 years old. He can get used to people dying <laughs> and that this happens. <laughs> like, he has had practice. <laughs> okay, you're not wrong, but I don't think it ever gets any easier. I mean, when the people you love die, it sucks. Um, but back to, back to what you just said about River protecting him. That's not how I read it at all. I read it as her protecting herself. So I think I think that's interesting. Just to clarify, you mean protecting herself because she wants to stay with him, so she's hiding her aging from him and her vulnerability, maybe. Or yeah, yeah, yeah h- hiding her vulnerability. Okay. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and again, if she is supposed to be this intelligent and capable and individual she should call him to task over that and say, well, then you're not worth me. It's, it's, it, it, like you say, it's a flaw in him and maybe it's even a flaw in her, which characters are allowed to have flaws. They are better for it. But it it was the one thing that, yeah, definitely was pointed out to me. I went, yeah, I can, I can completely see that and understand it. And, and talking through all this with you, it, it's quite interesting because I feel like this is the sort of feedback we've gotten from people as well. We've, we've had these two points of either, she's the most wonderful character written on a sci-fi show ever. And then the other side is she can lack agency. She's all about the Doctor rather than herself. And sometimes she comes across as not the most likable of characters. Right. It's fascinating to me that that's a thing because I'm on one side of that and it had never even occurred to me to think that anybody could think the other side. And so it's been really interesting talking to people about it and, and kind of figuring out where they're coming from and and what they're seeing and how they're seeing it differently than me. Mm. Once I finished watching these episodes and was talking to a few people on Twitter, uh, Laura, who suggested this whole process with the lists, uh, reached out and said that River is my favourite character by far and I like to model my life on hers. Not that that's a warning or anything. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We also had Stephanie Marie at I'm Stephtacular uh, respond to... Um, our tweet by saying she couldn't wait for this episode because River Song is her favorite character in the entire show and one of the greatest TV female characters written, in her opinion. 
So, uh, Rachel at Gypsy Book Nerd sent us a great email about all this. Hi, Mandy and Matthew. I'm fairly sure Andy, anything that Mandy says about River will echo my thoughts. I have tried to articulate some of what makes her so compelling to me. River is the companion that goes on adventures without the Doctor. Everyone wants to travel with the Doctor. The Doctor wants to travel with River. I think it's the way she manages to be intriguing to both 10 and 11. Not just because she knows things about him she shouldn't, also because she doesn't always need him. But when she does, she isn't shy about it. River is the ultimate survivor. She is strong and capable, has been through some horrible things, and come out the other side fiercer. She is also somehow able to carry the weight of the Doctor's secrets and sorrow without missing a beat. And if you can't admire a woman for that, I don't know what's wrong with you. For a long time, River was the closest to a lady Time Lord, Time Lady, that we were going to get. She is smart, sexy, sassy, knows her way around a vortex manipulator, and seems to pilot the TARDIS better than Doctor some days. She can even do everything the Doctor does, often backwards and in high heels. Which is a great reference. What a major. <laughs> when when Clara meets River in Name of the Doctor, she says she didn't realise she was a woman because Eleven always called her Professor Song. Is this because Eleven didn't want Clara to know she, he was married? My personal theory is that he left out the married bit because it was still too painful. He is still dealing with the lo- loss of the ponds and River hundreds of years later. I also suggest that he never told Clara her first name or that she was a woman because he thinks of her as a part of himself and the importance of River isn't her gender and being able to talk about her at all is a breakthrough. There is also something so personal about their relationship that it isn't anyone else's business and that makes it even more beautiful and heart-wrenching. Personal theory, youngish, seemingly carefree and sometimes goofy 11 regenerated into an older face 12 because he finally chose to embody the years and the weight of his past lives and choices and I honestly think River was a part of the reason he could do that. Theirs is one of my favourite love stories and now I'm tearing up just writing about it. Can't wait to hear Matthew's thoughts and Mandy's feeling. Love and kisses, Rachel. Rachel, I'm tearing up just listening to this. (laughs) I think this is fantastic and I think you articulated it so much better than I could. But I absolutely agree with you that River is the companion that goes on adventures without the Doctor. The River and Doctor have the kind of relationship where they need each other, but they don't need each other all of the time. And they have their own lives. And I I think that's something that we haven't really seen with the Doctor before. You know, when he was with Rose, he was with Rose all of the time. From the moment that Rose set foot in the TARDIS until... She got sucked into the wall in Doomsday. She was on the TARDIS with him, and they were having adventures. And he did the same thing with Martha that whole year they were together. Same thing with Donna. It was just once they step into the TARDIS, they're there until they're not. And with River, it wasn't like that. And it was just wonderful, and I loved it. The the one question that uh, does occur to me reading through Rachel's thoughts is about the Doctor wanting to travel with River. I'm not sure I can think of examples where I saw that. And, and I think this is part of the problem where, where I see her being there for him and her adventures, that, certainly that we see, revolving around him. But we never see him going, I'm going to seek out River now. I'm going to drop in everything and go to River. Well, he does ask her to travel with him and she says no. She says... Sometimes, anytime you want, just not all the time. And I, I think that's the most explicit textual example. Okay. But there is also the the extra stuff, the, the dates with Jim the Fish. And um, I, I do think in some of the Amy and Rory episodes that you didn't see, he does mention that he's seen River, or that he's gone out with River, oh, and he's really? gone to do something. Um, because I, I'm pretty sure I need to – God, I need to look this up, but I'm pretty sure there's a joke in there where he doesn't sleep. And so there's a joke where Amy is asking, well, what do you do when we're, we're sleeping? And he's like, well, that's when I'm out on my dates with River or something like that. And so like every night while they're sleeping, he's going out and having adventures with River because he's choosing to. And I think that might be what Rachel's referring to. Yeah. Was that in the Angels Take Manhattan? Maybe. I think I've seen that. Possibly. Who knows? It's not something that I had remembered mm. until just now when I was talking. But it's like, oh, yeah, I know that he said that while they're sleeping, he's out having adventures. Um, and so that's the thing that I'm thinking of. And then we've got those, you know, mini webisodes of, of his adventures with her where he's gone on those dates, you know. And, and so I think 
I think a little bit of it can be us reading what we want to see into it, but I'm okay with that. Okay. I think you got some feedback almost the other way about River. Yes. There was a really interesting conversation that, that we had on Twitter from a couple of folks who spoke up about maybe not loving the character of River um, completely. And I found it fascinating. And and most of it is is how she's written as a character. And I, I think this is definitely showing no love for Stephen Moffat. And we had uh, Jenna Katz at Cheshire J. Katz said uh, that River bothers her a little bit, mostly in the sense of how she's written. She does like her, but she comes on very strong. And she could never quite get over the age difference between the actors because it made her seem kind of predatory. But the biggest deal to her was that she was the epitome of Moffat-era female characters, where her entire existence revolves around the Doctor, which is gross, misogynistic writing, and was true of a lot of the female characters. And we had Hope at Biohazard Princess agree. She said, the, it's definitely in the writing. The Doctor is smug as well as River, and it almost feels condescending. And she also said that Jenna's predatory comment is more in line with what she means by condescending. And she wants to be careful because it's not about an independent or intelligent or attractive older woman. It's about the feeling that she's rubbing her knowledge in the face of the other characters and audience. Uh, the, and the spoilers thing. The spoilers mm. thing was definitely a point of contention. Um, Hello, sweetie, and spoilers both feel condescending to some people, and I I can totally see that. I can understand that, especially if you're coming to the story late, and your introduction to the show is maybe season six, you know, and and that's that's what you're seeing. It it can feel very much like I know something you don't know, and. That's not mm. something anybody likes to feel. Yeah, I can completely see reacting to the character in that way. Because you're watching the TV show to uncover it with the characters and to ha- suddenly have this character there who knows stuff that you don't. It's really frustrating. I think I've spoken about other TV shows that do a whole season of basically uncovering the next question. And you could pretty much skip everything between the first episode and the last episode and, and you're still fine. I think... I quite enjoy the character, but because she's quite fun in the way she uses that to me. And I also think the, the predatory thing is difficult because, yes, there is an obvious age difference between the actors. But the characters, it almost goes entirely the other way. So it's, oh, how much do you buy into what you're seeing there? And how much do you read of, of them having chemistry or not? Because that's, that's completely subjective. So hmm. I think for me, Alex Kingston just has chemistry with everybody she's on screen with. Mm-hmm. So... Anything she does is going to work for me. This is a, a, a question about future stuff, but are you interested in the audiobooks that she did with Sylvester McCoy and I think Peter Davison or Colin Baker? I am. I Big Fish Audio has done a lot of new audio stuff. Some of it with River, some of it with uh, Tennant and Billy Piper, Tennant and Catherine Tate, and I want to listen to all of them. Okay. I just haven't had time because who has time for anything besides podcasting yeah that's going to take a lot of months of audible subscriptions to be able to get them in fact i'm assuming they're available on audible i have no idea uh they are actually i think i'm interested just because i like sylvester mccoy so (laughs) of course you do yeah he is your doctor right if you have a doctor yes yeah he's your doctor yes he absolutely is because he's the one I, i can remember being the first doctor i saw fresh so We also had some great questions from people that they asked for answers from. So, Mandy, I demand answers to these. (laughs) Okay. Um, uh, Rachel at Gypsy Book Nerd uh, also sent a few questions. Does River work for you as a character? Oh, absolutely. She is one of my favorite, favorite characters of the show. Yeah, I think think we both answered that one quite comprehensively. (laughs) Um, Yes. What did you learn about the Doctor watching the Ponds and River episodes? I think I'd like you to answer this question first. I'm not sure I have an answer. What did I learn about the Doctor? I'm not sure this is something I learned, but I was surprised by sometimes how the Doctor gave in to the situation and accepted what he was being presented with in positive and negative ways. Sometimes about how he couldn't change something or he had to accept something about someone dying or 
various things that people had to go through, but also in not reading the book, not demanding answers in stuff. And sometimes that not demanding answers, this is exactly what I'm saying about TV shows. People don't talk each other to drive up the tension um, and to get give you another episode where they find out the thing they could find out if they asked them. We had a little bit of that, but generally it was it was all explainable because they only had short periods together. Right. Okay. Well, what did I learn about the Doctor watching these episodes? Rule one, the Doctor lies. <laughs> and, and they leaned on that very heavily. You, oh, you yes, cannot absolutely. trust anything you're shown, particularly in Pandorica, I think, and the one after the Pandorica, and then... The Big Bang. Yeah, the Big Bang, and then in the Wedding of River Song. Yes. Yeah, you cannot trust anything you see. I mean, it all makes perfect sense. Mm. Oh, absolutely. When you see but, all of it, but when you only see part of it, uh, you, you cannot trust yeah. the doctor the doctor lies. And, and this is evidence I would give for why the show is particularly concerned with giving you the emotional piece of the narrative rather than a whole concise thing that fits together really nicely. You know, several times we see the doctor die, but then, oh, it's a robot thing pretending to be the doctor or oh he's not actually dead he just said he was dead <laughs> right it's like that so you get the emotional oh my god well don't know how they're gonna get out of this one. Oh no he's not actually dead anyway they lied to us cool <laughs> thanks tv show right <laughs> <laughs> next question worst enemy or monster madam kavarian are you treating worst as lamest no awfulest Awful list. Okay. I mean, from a from the perspective of, of a human being, she's awful. I think the worst monster was the silence because they're really the only monster we have in this in this run. Um, but she is a human being who decides to kidnap a pregnant woman and put a fake woman in her place who thinks that she's real and then steals the woman's baby and raises that child and programs her to kill the doctor you know i just think as a human being she is awful yeah (laughs) yeah i didn't even consider her as a monster because like i I, I wouldn't have put the master in that well i mean it says worst enemy or oh does it okay it does and so as an enemy that that's where i'm I'm putting her Oh, I did like, it's just reminded me, I liked him telling Nixon, you have to record everything that goes on in this office. (laughs) (laughs) That was quite nice. Um, A complete side note, there's been a really interesting episode of 20,000 Hertz recently, a a podcast about sound, but about the recording in the White House. And they've got really early tapes and stuff. That was worth listening to. It's just reminded me of that. Next question. Favorite thing about the doctor that works but shouldn't? His goofiness. What do you mean by goofiness? Oh, everything. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I am specifically talking about Eleven here, even though we did get one Capaldi episode. Although Capaldi had some goofiness too, like the antlers. But I'm specifically thinking of things like I wear a fez now, fezes are cool. And. You know, I wear a Stetson now. Stetsons are cool. And, you know, him just being flaily and all over the place and exuberant to the point of being almost childlike in his exuberance. It's all just very goofy. But it balances out that super, super intense darkness that the doctor still carries at this point in his story. And so it works. Oh, oh, I have another one. <laughs> but it, it totally fits into my goofiness thing. Okay. The doctor speaks baby. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, See? God. It totally works, but it shouldn't. No, it did not work. Yes, it did. Um, favorite thing that works that shouldn't. I have no idea how to articulate this. But the thing that works but shouldn't is... The implication that he has many, many adventures outside of what we see, because each iteration of the Doctor is like a hundred plus years old. But every okay. every few years in our time, he chooses to sacrifice himself. Or or he is killed by a thing and he regenerates. So every every so often, every okay. really random time in all of his adventures, something gets the better of him and he does not succeed. Right. Um in a, in a different show, I feel like they would not be able to pull that off. 
I would be like, oh, well, here it is. It's the end of season again. Time for New Doctor. Oh, <laughs> like okay. every three seasons, effectively. Right. But Doctor Who doesn't do that. It's a surprise when you hear there is going to be a new Doctor. And it makes it believable that this Doctor has gone off and had many adventures and had the opportunity for many adventures. There's no... There is enough gap in there for you to be able to believe there are things we haven't seen that they can do comics and audiobooks and other stories about. Right. Yeah. Okay. At Katie Sheru asks, are bow ties cool? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I own like eight, so yeah. <laughs> uh, and, unlike the Doctor, mine can be undone. So, hmm. he wears clip-ons. <laughs> Okay. Uh, at Slayers, comma, the, are you going to watch all of the new seasons now? Mandy, are you going to watch any more Doctor Who after this? Has this put you off? Has this been too much Doctor Who? Oh, uh, I'm going to have to think about it. <laughs> and by think about it, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited about Jeremy, you guys. <laughs> are you, ex- so are you excited. excited about the Christmas special? The, the last Peter Capaldi? Oh, yeah. Actually, I am. I am, just because it's... I'm not looking forward to watching Peter Capaldi regenerate because that always makes me cry. But we are getting Bill back and we're going to get to see an adventure with the first Doctor. And it's going to be lots and lots of craziness. And I think it's going to be wonderful. Are we getting Bill back? Yes. Okay. You didn't answer that question. Are you going to watch all of the new seasons now? I'm not sure. I will watch the Christmas special. I will watch the first of Jodie Whittaker. What this has very definitely shown me is the ones to watch are the first of each new season. The middle episodes of each season and the last two of each season. <laughs> I might be watching them. Well, but I will say, though, that with a new showrunner coming on, that formula may change. Mm. It may not, mm. <laughs> but it may. So we'll see. And, and particularly, the first season of each new Doctor is, in inverted commas, ordinary. There's not particularly a huge overarching plot to it. It's then, certainly in the seasons we've watched so far, so the past ten seasons <laughs> yes, uh, no, well, well let's let, let's ignore Christopher Eccleston because that's obviously a rule unto itself um but it's then been right now we're going to get into dealing with the silence dealing with uh whatever David Tennant had to deal with because I've forgotten all of David Tennant's series now well he had the Daleks and he had the Cybermen and the Adipose which you didn't get to see <laughs> but the, the the larger ongoing stories with him I think the only thing we really had in that first season of Matt Smith was Amy's Crack. Yes. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> We're leaving that in. <laughs> oh, goodness. Dr. Kelly Jones asked, what do you like most about River Song? What do you think it adds to Doctor Who to view the story through her perspective? The thing that I like most about River Song is River Song. And I know that's cheating and I don't care. <laughs> what do you think it adds to Doctor Who to view the story through her perspective? I think that if we did get to see more of the story through River's perspective, we might get to see a little bit more of what you were hoping we would see. Uh, how she falls in love with the Doctor and, and why and we would be shown things rather than told things. And I think that could be really interesting and valuable to see too. Interesting. Because I feel like we'd get less hero worship of the Doctor. I know that's not technically adding anything. (laughs) But there's the joke of them referring to him as the damsel, which I think is not a great joke. But if we take it at face value, that she's often going in and saving him, there really would be this thing of him being like, Hey, how do you know how to drive the TARDIS? Those blue buttons don't do anything. <laughs> They're boring buttons. Like, it really would be much more about he's actually a bit crap sometimes and she has to go and save him or tell him what to do or take over in general terms. Hmm, okay. But the show is called Doctor Who, so we follow him and we see explanations for why he does or doesn't know things. At I Do Human Things asked, do you foresee yourself going back and re-watching any episode? I will rewatch all of the episodes. Is there anything you would, even after this project now, you would say, oh, I would happily sit down and watch that at any time? All of David Tennant. <laughs> Actually, no, that's not true. That's not true. Season two and season four of David Tennant. 
in season five and season six and season nine and season 10. Wow, I like to do that in twos, don't I? <laughs> Those are the ones that I would want to go back to, but I, you know I am a completionist, and so I'm just going to go back to the beginning and start all over, but... Those are the ones that while I was going through this time, I was like, wow, I really forgot how wonderful these were. I, I find that quite interesting because you, you didn't say season three there, which means you lose human nature, family of blood, blink, sound of the drums, lost the time lords, which I felt like were episodes you really, really loved. Uh, human nature and family of blood, no. Okay. I don't really don't care about those episodes at all. Okay. Um, but I I mostly skip that season as a whole just because it's Martha season and I'm not super interested in it. Even though I do like the end game of that season, I do like the the sound of drums and whatever that epi- other episode was. <laughs> Last of the time lords. <laughs> yes, Last of the time lords and sound of drums. But I don't need them. They're not my favorites. Okay. They're really good. But since I was giving you seasons and not single episodes, I would skip season three if if I were skipping things. Mm. Okay. I, I have gone back and watched a few just to fill in gaps and explain stuff. And, and then I've watched a few not on the list, um, again, to fill in some of those gaps and see is there anything I would have added to the list. I, I'd probably say Blink and then Silence in the Library, uh, Forest of the Dead. I, okay. I, I I have watched them again, and I have enjoyed watching them again. Having done the project now, is there anything I'd go back and watch? I'm not sure. Are you just kind of done with Doctor Who now? Yeah, I'm not sure there's anything I'd go back to. I, I, I would okay. sit people down in front of Heaven Sent. That, I thought, was a good episode. Um, and I think last time I, I mentioned about Magician's Apprentice, which is familiar, I really enjoyed them. So th- yes. there's a few in there that I would recommend to people who probably knew Doctor Who but wanted something interesting to watch. Okay. Um, and then another one from I Do Human Things. Favorite long game storyline? River. Yeah? Yeah, River. It's my favorite season. I always say David Tennant is my favorite Doctor. Uh, the Stolen Earth and Journey's End are my favorite episodes. And season six is my favorite season. So what are the long game storylines that we've got? The Master. Is that the master is all of season two and three, isn't it? Yeah, but then even leading up into Missy, yeah. I think we could count okay. that. Uh, Especially since they tied Johnson back to Missy, so that counts. Mm. Um, I think Clara is one, but considering you got to see the first episode and the last episode of that, it probably doesn't <laughs> count for you. And then I think probably, I don't know that this counts as long game, but it was definitely a longer arc, but the end of season four. With Donna, Donna mm. being the most important person in the universe, the Doctor Donna, all of the foreshadowing leading up to that, and then we start with Turn Left, The Stolen Earth, and Journey's End. I think that I would count that as a long game story. Okay, so River herself has a story, but she's part of the story of the building up to the name of the Doctor. Yes. And the time of the Doctor. Hmm. Okay. What am I thinking? I'm thinking. That story arc is effectively finished by the name of the Doctor and the time of the Doctor at the end of that arc. But it also includes the impossible astronaut, let's kill Hitler, good mag. River's not in the time of the Doctor. No, she's not. But that concludes the whole thing about the silence. And she is part okay, She is okay, part of the okay. Church of the Silence's plot. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. But if we, you could take out all the River episodes that are not to do with her killing him. So you include Let's Kill Hitler and maybe A Good Man Goes to War about the theft of River. And then you'd also have The Impossible Astronaut and The Wedding of River Song. I think I enjoy that more, like I've said, because the end of the River Song story leaves me a bit dissatisfied. I think I'd lean more into the efforts of the Church of the Silence to stop everyone on Transalor in that one episode, but then also the silence in general, the river arc to kill him overall. That's more interesting. The, the stopping the answering of the question arc. Okay. There must be a better word so for that. So you would basic, yeah, I think you would end your arc with the wedding of River Song. Like that would be the end of it for you because that's the one where she reveals to Amy at the very end that the doctor's not actually dead. No, I think it ends with the time of the Doctor. Because that's where it explains the whole arc of like, oh, this is what the silence were, and this is what River was. This is why 
these people were, were trying to kill him because they did not want the question being answered. And eventually it ends up with him fighting the Daleks because it's always the Daleks. <laughs> it is always the Daleks or the Cybermen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and like I'm saying that particularly because I think throughout all of this, my favorite enemy monster has been the Silence. They are very well done. They're incredibly sinister. The the power set that they have is really good. It's it's strong enough to make them a big threat, but also make them defeatable. It, it the the way that they put tallies on themselves when they've seen them is quite sinister. The the hand voice message thing is very good to be like, oh, okay, that's really creepy. Now it's suddenly lit up. More than anything, I was disappointed it was resolved in an episode. That we didn't have more of an arc yeah. of them learning to tally and doing all this. It was just... Right. Because, I, I think I've said before, the whole plot was to take over the Earth. And and arguably the point that they made was the Earth has been taken over. We now need to fight back. It means you have to resolve them all at once. Rather than it being a sort of constant... All the silence are here again. Now we have to find a new way because they've adapted to what we did last time. Mm. Right. Okay. All right. Well, Matthew, I think it's time for you to tell us what your favorite moments were from this arc. Uh, there's a good number of them. There was some very good stuff in this. I, I must have heard it before when we'd watched some of the other episodes, but Matt Smith's character theme really came to the fore in this. Uh, it's very reminiscent of Mass Effect, um, but it's very orchestral. It's got lots of different movements as it moves through it, and it can be used in different ways. And You, you, you get bars of it used in other sequences every so often. Uh, and I... I yeah, I really enjoyed it. And then going and listening to other pe- other Doctor's character themes. Yeah, it's just it's so much better than theirs. They're, theirs are all fairly ordinary, so... Yeah, they're ordinary enough that I didn't even realize that they had their own themes mm. until you sent me the links to them. Because we had this conversation, actually, b- before we did the last episode, um, because Matt Smith's theme shows up in The Eleventh Hour. In his very first episode, mm. we get it. And I just remember being like, oh, yeah, I remember this. And this just makes me happy and, like, upbeat. And I just want him to win because that's that's what that song does, you know. And so so you linked me to um, Eccleston and Tennant's themes. And I remember thinking, I don't even remember ever hearing these. Mm. But Matt Smith's, every time he's being clever, every time he's about to win – Every episode, you get yeah. it. Dun, dun, dun. And I dun, love dun. it. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it makes me happy. It makes me smile like a crazy mm. person. And, and knowing that it can be done so well, it'll be interesting to see if they introduce a new one for Jodie Whittaker. Some sort of electric cello, maybe. That would be wonderful. That's a Wonder Woman reference there. <laughs> yes, it is. That's why I said it would be Wonder. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've really enjoyed seeing Rory through all these episodes. Um, I, I I think I've missed something in his arc slightly because I didn't see him dying initially and then him coming back with her having forgotten about him. I saw, I saw that side of it. But he's got a really nice consistent character that combines him being fairly brave with him also being very direct. He's the one who spots where there is a very ordinary reason for something or a very basic question they need to be asking. But he is always steadfast and always prepared to follow Amy and the Doctor and work with them and help them and support them. He's right. a great character. He's probably the best companion. He is pretty great, mm. I will say that. I, he's definitely better than Mickey was, even though Mickey did have some great character development by the end. But but Rory is just in a class of his own. Mm. And he died in an episode um, where he got swallowed by Amy's crack. Ah, what a way to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that's why she couldn't remember him, right. because things that that got eaten by that crack in the universe just did not exist in time anymore. Um, and I think we made a joke last time about how he's basically the Doctor in DC's Legends of Tomorrow. But yet yes. they are two distinct characters. He's he's fairly ordinary looking, um, Arthur Darville. He's not distinctive like Matt Smith is. Is has a very distinctive look about him. So he's able to portray them and come across very differently in each different character. I really like that. He he does a very good job. He does mm. do a very good job. And I think I alluded to it earlier where we have the moment of River driving the TARDIS and Matt Smith um, 
getting a bit uppity about her driving the TARDIS and not wanting her to and not, not liking the fact that she can do it better than him. And him pretending to do the noise. <laughs> It's just so good. (laughs) Because, like, again, I've said it in the past, he downplays with a bit more humility some of his silliness and his jokes. So when uh, someone else doing this, the the TARDIS noise, would do it very grand, a very big noise, he just does this sort of strange kind of chimpanzee... (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> and he's just, he's just doing this in front of River and Amy and looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Yeah. This, it's supposed to make this noise. Yeah. Come on. And then just her, yeah. her reaction, like, it's not supposed to make that noise. You leave the brakes on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Nice writing. Now, bef- before we move on to your next thing, did you pick up, though, on who taught River how to drive the TARDIS? Isn't it the TARDIS itself? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you picked up on that. I can't remember where we learned that, but there is something where she says that. Uh, it's in Let's Kill Hitler. Okay. Cool. I can't. I also can't remember the significance of it. Not nothing really. It's just. Um, I mean, she has two choices: either the TARDIS taught her or the Doctor taught mm-hmm. her, and it could be that the Doctor taught her in the Doctor's future, which would be her past. But I think it's interesting that she flies so much better than he does, and it's because the TARDIS itself taught her how to fly. Mm. That that was all. You remember when we watched Farscape and we quite enjoyed that Moya was a character? I, yes. I get the impression they want to do that with the TARDIS, but they never quite get there. So I'm also thinking of the, an- the Antlers. Uh, no. no, go ahead. Well, I, I'm also thinking of the Antlers because he, he directly says, you're a time travel machine, stop putting antlers on my head, stop trying to cheer me up. There is an episode that we did not put on the list. And once you heard the name of the episode, you were like, no, I'm not going to watch it. But it's an episode called The Doctor's Wife. Okay. <laughs> and in that episode, there is actually an actress who plays the TARDIS. The TARDIS embodies a physical human okay. form. So if you are interested in seeing the TARDIS being an actual character who can kiss. <laughs> no. No. But, but thank you. I didn't you. mean to say who can kiss, but... <laughs> I was thinking of one of the quotes that the TARDIS has. The TARDIS says, I like biting. It's like kissing, but somebody wins. <laughs> it's a great line. <laughs> and that was in my head, and that's why that came out. But if you're interested in seeing the TARDIS be an actual character, then go watch The Doctor's okay. Wife. I mean, it's really not a great episode story-wise, but it is really nice to see somebody embody the TARDIS. And, and if they try to follow through with that in some of these episodes are, are they trying to do the thing of the TARDIS as a character not not a you know bipedal character I mean they've kind of always done that a little bit I mean the doctor talks to her mm. and the the TARDIS has a will of its own and will take the doctor where the doctor needs to go even if it's not where the doctor wants to go um, we, we've had a lot of that but it, it's not as explicit as Moya is in Farscape okay and then also in the Husbands of River song, I mean, there, there were a lot of good moments in this. As I say, if the ending didn't leave me disgruntled, um, I, I would be gushing about it. But there are a couple of great moments, particularly the Doctor pretending to go into the TARDIS for the first time. And, and even the build-up for that is terrific, where he has his moment of, finally, it's my go. Finally. Finally. It's my go. God! Oh, it's bigger. Uh, yes. On the inside. But we need to concentrate. There it is. Yeah, I know where you're going with this, but I need you to calm down. On the outside? Oh, you certainly grasp the essentials. My entire understanding of physical space has been transformed. Three-dimensional Euclidean geometry has been torn up through the air and slapped. To death, my grasp of the universal constants of physical reality has been changed forever. Sorry, I've always wanted to see that done properly. <laughs> yes. And, and, and oh, when, yes. when he said that, I thought it was him meaning finally he's the one who's got spoilers on her. 
that he oh. this was the first time he knew more than her. And then he does this spiel. But then he does his whole thing of like cracking up. Three dimensional Euclidean geometry has been torn up, thrown in the air. <laughs> And the yes. over-the-topness of you know, physical reality has been changed forever. <laughs> How she didn't pick up on it at that point, I don't know. I mean, other than, obviously, the writers didn't want her to. Yeah. But it's, she's just like, dude, settle down. You're over the top. Yeah, all, all the way through this episode, I was watching it going, I don't know if she knows or not. I, I genuinely, up until the, the, the point where she starts going into her whole thing at the end, I did not know whether she knew and was just covering it for reasons. I will say that was my reaction the first time I watched mm. it too. I was unsure because she was so over the top and so sure that the doctor wasn't there. Mm. And, but she was working with this stranger who, you know what yeah. I mean? Like it was. Who we never see again. It was a little bit bizarre. So I, I don't know. It, I felt that way too the very first time mm. I saw it, and then when we got to the speech at the end, it was amazing. yeah. And the, and then that's the the other moment that I wanted to comment on because because the speech itself is so earnest. I, I feel like perhaps she does believe it, but her whole piece about he's not here. God knows where he is right now, but I promise you, he's doing whatever the hell he wants and not giving a damn about me. And I'm just fine with that. When you love the doctor, it's like loving the stars themselves. You don't expect a sunset to admire you back. And if I happen to find myself in danger, let me tell you, the doctor is not stupid enough or sentimental enough, and he is certainly not in love enough to find himself standing in it with me. Like, that's a... Because it's so believable, the way she's giving it there. Yeah. And and that was the point. I'm like, oh, she really doesn't know. This is about to be a reveal. This is really good. And and, and the reveal itself. So He just looks at her. And and they hold that just perfectly for so long. And he finally gives her a, hello, sweetie. And it's not over the top. It's not bombastic. It's not a big big reveal it's just this is going to be heavy and it's going to hit you and she knows and then she has to take several moments and this is i think what you were alluding to earlier they break into some of the funniest doctor who has been you are so doing those roots what the roots of the sunset (laughs) (laughs) oh i hate you (laughs) i'll have to check with the stars themselves (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's it's just so good they in this episode, they balanced the levity with those big sentimental moments. And really, this is the only big, big sentimental moment besides the very mm. end. But it's big enough to carry the rest of the episode mm. for me. And because it's just, it's wonderful. because it had gone on so long, they had to make it a big moment. The earlier mm-hmm. you reveal it, the less impact it needs to have. But by this point, like they've been through a lot. She has revealed a lot to him about... The fact she knows her time is coming to an end because she's running out of pages in the diary. Things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was going to have a lot of emotional weight. And it has the correct amount of emotional weight. You know, he teases her, but they are there in this together because he is standing there with her like she said she wouldn't believe he would. Now, you asked me a question earlier about whether I thought he believed her not caring for him. Do you believe her saying she doesn't believe the Doctor loves her back? That's a really tough question. I think I want to say no because she is such a larger than life confident woman that of course she believes that he loves her because why wouldn't anybody love River Song? But when you just listen to the way that she delivers those words, mm. you know, she's she is trying to save him and and keep them away from him, yes, but she is so overcome with emotion and and it just feels so earnest that I do think she believes it. I think she sees herself as tiny and finite, and she sees the Doctor as infinite and huge. And like she says, it's like loving the stars themselves. You don't expect them to love you back. But it also could be that I'm just a sentimental, crazy person. 
Yeah, I think she does believe he loves her. I don't think she believes herself there. But I think that is one of those, the, the revelation of her innermost worries. That's fair. Yeah. I, I, I think she doesn't even have a line of, like, I'm just keeping them talking. <laughs> right. Um But, uh, yeah, if you were in that relationship with that person, you are probably being like, like, am I just, like, super companion to him? You know, a longer version of the the bits that he picks up from Earth and spends a little bit of time with. Hmm. Right. It worked for me. How about that? Oh, it it is a very good moment. It's done incredibly well. Hmm. I'm not going to pile on about the end of that episode, though. Hmm. Okay. (laughs) It is your turn. Mandy, what are some of your favorite things about the River Song arc? Well, now that you've stolen half of them. (laughs) (sighs) Okay. I'm going to go with In the Wedding of River Song. River has another very impassioned speech, this time to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to keep him from essentially killing himself and undoing all of the craziness that happened. Um, when she did not kill him as as was intended. You've touched so many lives, saved so many people. Did you think when your time came, you'd really have to do more than just ask? You've decided that the universe is better off without you, but the universe doesn't agree. And I just love how impassioned she is when she's trying to save him because mm. you can see even then she loves him so much. Yeah. Um, and the flip side of that is actually in the name of the doctor when she asks how he can see her and he responds, you're always here to me and I always listen and I can always see you. And it breaks my heart every oh, really? time. <laughs> every time. I tear up. I teared up yesterday watching this. <laughs> well, certainly when you first watched it, did it surprise you about the fact he could see her? Yes. Because he played it really well that he couldn't. And he shouldn't have been able to. No. You know, it's a little woo-woo, but whatever, he can. It's romantic that he can. He loves her so much that he's always linked to her and he can see her. And he chose to pretend like he couldn't because it hurt too much, not her, him. And I thought the re- that he revealed that it hurt him so much was a huge moment of vulnerability for him, and I adore mm. it. Uh, he also had another great moment in the same episode when they introduced the War Doctor, and he is basically trying to tell Clara why he's terrible and horrible and he very emphatically says the name I chose is the doctor it doesn't matter what my name is I chose the doctor and I liked that yeah what's the follow up to that something like he betrayed that name or um what he did he did not do in the name of the doctor which is why it's called the name of the doctor Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I think he says something like he did it in vengeance or or something but it was most certainly not in the name of the doctor Mm. and then of course basically ever every interaction that river and 12 had in the husbands of river song because they it was so great and they just played off of each other so well you know his reaction to her saying i basically married the diamond and him trying to get her not to take the tardis and you know well certainly he's gonna notice well he's never noticed before (laughs) and i thought that was hysterical like just her Throwing off this one-off line that she's been stealing the TARDIS to have her own adventures is incredible. And he's never noticed. Like His reaction to that was wonderful, and I loved it. Okay, the way they use time travel with River Song is exactly how I want time travel used in a science fiction story. This thing of, I can steal it now and bring it back in a second, and we're all good. Or, the end. in fact, shortly after that, in uh, the end of the episode, where... He turns up and gives someone an idea to build the restaurant there. He then goes forward and books an appointment, and he then takes it further forward to that appointment date. Like, that is how you use time travel. (laughs) Yes. Doctor Who is not consistent with how they use time travel, and it got really bad, really, really bad in uh, season five when, you know, he was supposed to come back for Amy in five minutes, and he came back in 12 years. Hmm. And that continued to happen over and over and over again he thought he was bringing her back actually that happened with rose too in an episode you didn't see she was gone for like two years a year and when she came back she thought she had only been gone for a few minutes and jackie had put flyers up everywhere because her daughter was missing and she had no idea where she was and so from the beginning that happened but it got really bad 
in season five. And it doesn't make sense, but it's one of those things that I can just do a hand wavy whistle mm. pass and be fine but with. But the, the way they sometimes put a time lock on something, <gasps> we have to get this done in such a short amount of time, but we need more time to be able to do it. But hey, I've got a time machine, guys. <laughs> Why don't I just go back in time and build the thing? When like we could take a week and build it really nicely and put some chrome on the sides, get it like a bit of red, bit of black, really smooth and sleek, and then it's gonna be awesome. <sighs> no, that, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's crossing the streams, and you just can't do that in Doctor Who. But you know you could for all of the other hand wavy stuff they do. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like perhaps it's gotten better in the recent seasons, like you say. That's that's the big thing. They they've sort of gotten a handle on it. Possibly as the shows become a bit more legit, like oh, people are calling us up on this stuff when it's not as good as it should be. So we do need to take it into consideration. It is definitely less campy than it used mm. to be. Yeah, we talked about it from Jan's comment last time about it used to be easier to watch as a family and now a bit less so, particularly right. when you have River on on board. Yep. I'm quite the screamer. There's a spoiler for you. <laughs> yeah, that was a good line too. I, I tweeted that line. I tweeted a lot when I was watching these episodes because, I mean, like I said, they're just my favorite. Nice. So I was quoting them like crazy on Twitter, and it was wonderful. There was good. There was good stuff in here. It's very solid. I'm so happy to hear mm. you say that. All right. Well, is there anything else that we need to discuss about Doctor Who? Because we have run on very long this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we've been gushing. You're going to do some fun <laughs> editing on this one. Um, on on Doctor Who, are you still or more or less or any interested in watching the original seasons of Doctor Who? I've always been interested. I think it's just still overwhelming because there's so much. And I feel like I have to start at the beginning and watch all of it. Unless somebody would be kind enough to curate a list like I did for <laughs> you. And even then I'm still going to be a little bit like, well, but I probably missed something. And... Maybe they talked about this before and I would understand it better, have a, a richer, fuller understanding of what's happening if I watched all of it. And that's just a lot of episodes. Mm. And potentially it's less good because some of it is quite so old or missing. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there mm. is that. <laughs> okay, so interested. I, if it sounds like you're not any more interested than before we started talking about this. No. So, and, and the list concept itself... Um, I definitely want to say thank you to Laura for the suggestion. This has been a really good way to do it, I think. Um, do you think this is something we could apply to other TV shows? I think sometimes, yes. I don't think we should do it for every TV show. Not every TV show has the scope mm. that we would need to. You know, I think what we did for Farscape worked really well for Farscape because we did a season, an episode, and there were only four. Mm. You know, so that that's a little bit of a different animal. I think for something... That has nine or ten seasons where each season is like 30 episodes like Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm-hmm. You know, that could be a show if we were going to do it, which obviously we're not because we both like that and we've seen it. But if, if it were something like that, I think doing a list in the same vein could be helpful, I think. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking particularly uh, the other Star Treks, DS9, Voyager, um, maybe Enterprise. I'm not sure how many... En- Episodes Enterprise would end up as maybe like sixteen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, shots fired. Um, but okay. I'm also thinking the X Files, which is now ten seasons, a couple of hundred episodes. Oh goodness! Yeah, so that that would be something you could cut down, particularly because there is a very core story that gets about four or five episodes per season. Okay, so very much that's one that could work. when they did the. Um, Oh, what was it called? They they did a really short series season last year, I think. And in the run up to that, I rewatched all of the conspiracy episodes. And again, that was like 60 episodes or something. But that was really good because you actually go, oh, there there is more of a cohesive thread through this than I remember there being when I was watching it over the whole season or, or years apart. When you watch it together, you go, oh, well, they introduced this concept much earlier than I remember it be, becoming a thing. So they do, uh, you know, sow some seeds as they go through. Um, the, th- the thing with the X-Files is there are some episodes that aren't conspiracy episodes that are truly wonderful. Well, but then those could be, you know, some of those nuanced episodes that, that we added mm. in for Doctor Who. Mm, the sure. ones that even though you ended up not enjoying them and would take them off of your list could be helpful. Yeah. So in terms of TV watching, 
what are we up to next? What's what's next for our, our third Tuesday television? Well, in November, we are going to start Parks and Recreation for real this time. Hey. You may remember that we did a special bonus episode just looking at the pilot of Parks and Rec, and I, I do was not super excited about that. <laughs> and I've been talked into watching all of season one and all of season two, and so we will be doing season one and season two in that first episode. And I have now gotten into season two of Parks and Rec, and I will say it is much more enjoyable than it was mm-hmm. just from watching the pilot. So you guys were right. <laughs> Um, say. We'll talk about it next month. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to change tack a bit and take on a, a sitcom. Um, I'm never 100 percent about recording about sitcoms because the I think I've said before the writing doesn't have to be as solid as it does for something that's a drama or an ongoing show like this. The writing is there to support comedy more than it is character and theme. I think Parks and Rec sits in the middle of that, so it should be good. We'll see. Mm. I've still got a lot to watch. <laughs> you do indeed. <laughs> but also, the other good thing, these are only 22 minutes per episode. Hey. <laughs> yes, and season one only had six episodes. Nice. <laughs> I was so excited when I hit the next episode, and it was season two, episode one, and I was like, what? I'm done with season one? <laughs> it was wonderful. So you've seen the opening of season two, episode one? Yes. The, the opening of season two, episode one, is better than the whole of season one. When she breaks into the rap and it turns out someone's on fire. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. That w- I laughed. Yep. I really only laughed once in season one. Yeah. yeah. I may have smiled a few times, but I only laughed once. Yeah. But these are all things that we should be talking about in our Parks and Rec. Yeah, I don't know so. why you're bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had loads of great feedback from previous Doctor Who episodes, uh, not necessarily in the form of questions. So uh, we heard from Laura, Laura Esperi, about Blue Peter. Uh, You might remember I struggled to explain what Blue Peter was. Um, She said that, yes, Clara, as the Blue Peter presenter, is bang on. Hashtag explaining Blue Peter to Americans. I asked her if she could help me define what makes Clara a really good Blue Peter presenter. Uh, her definition, explanation, is that it's she is clean-cut, pretty girl next door, capable, can imagine her abseiling down a cliff, whilst also doing something impressive with sticky back plastic. She's a bit prim and school marmish, educational, but not just a teacher thing, but with others, unlikely to be embroiled in a sex scandal. A- and the final note, this that I think is absolutely bang on, I imagine she sends thank you notes. Yes. She wants to impress adults and is not forced to do so. (laughs) Okay. That's the sort of person who would be presenting Blue Peter. Well, I think that describes Clara pretty perfectly. Yeah, and that's that's, that's absolutely why she fits him. Yeah, okay. Uh, Kate at I Do Human Things said, uh, referencing monster fighting, I feel like anyone could beat up one adipose. Yeah, that's because I said I didn't think that I would win against any of the monsters. And Doctor Who, and Kate was like, um, excuse me, adipose, which you didn't see, but she's absolutely right. Although I wouldn't want to fight an adipose because they were cute and cuddly. (laughs) It's funny, I think the new Star Wars film has got creatures like that in, so I'll be interested to hear whether they've wholesale stolen them Mm. come December. Okay, that's the first I've heard of this. Mm. Okay. I keep seeing new toys listed. Um, and finally, at, uh, Lauren at Six Legged Knits said the War Doctor couldn't have been Eccleston. In Rose, he's clearly just regenerated, making faces in the mirror and commenting on his ears and nose. And, and yes, I think the, the writing would have had to have been slightly different or hand wavy. I just feel like this introduction of this new spare Doctor uh, was perhaps the hand was forced a bit. Like I said earlier, Doctor Who does not care so much about its own continuity. <laughs> We also had a voice message from Jen at Generosity about her perspective on Star Trek versus Doctor Who. Hi, Matthew and Mandy. I just wanted to leave you guys a message saying that I love your show. It's really one of the highlights for me. It feels like I'm sitting down to talk about movies and stuff with my friends. So no matter whether I've seen it or not, I always love to hear you guys chatting about whatever you've watched that week. Also wanted to mention, one of the key differences for me so far with Doctor Who and Star Trek is that with Star Trek, there's usually a much more teamwork approach. They have an entire crew to work with for 
giving important pieces of information. And different crew members get to shine on different episodes. Uh, they really bring a lot of diverse things to it. And with Doctor Who, you get that a little bit with some of the guest stars and things like that. But really, it comes down to the Doctor being a brilliant person and saving the day each week. So that for me is one of the big things where, you know, Star Trek, you get to see a lot of different people shine with different strengths and weaknesses. So, yeah, keep up the great work. Can't wait to hear what you bring next week. Bye. And we would also love to hear from you. If you'd like to leave us a voice message, go to speakpipe.com slash eloquent gushing. All right. Well, if you'd like to have your thoughts featured in this segment, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. And you can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. Pop Culture Deprived is completely funded by listeners like you through our Patreon. Anything you can give to us gives exclusive content and also helps support the network and develop new shows. To find out more, please go to patreon.com slash eloquent gushing. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest news and announcements, remember to subscribe to the weekly newsletter. The link is on eloquentgushing.com. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about the 1990 miniseries of Stephen King's It. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm going to need a bigger floor chart. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, visit eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.